Old powers waken, shadows stir. An age of wonder and terror will soon be upon us. An age for gods and heroes. The glass candles are burning, and you're listening to the Obsidian Knights Podcast. Hello, my sweet summer children. In today's episode of the Obsidian Knights podcast, we are doing one of my absolute favorite chapters of A Game of Thrones, and that is Brand 3. And today, my special guest is Reddit Theory Extraordinaire Cantus. I'm so thankful that you're joining me to break down a chapter of Game of Thrones. Thanks for coming. Would you like to let the people know who you are and where they can find your amazing work? Love to. So my name is Sean. Uh, I, my Reddit handle is Cantus or C A N T U S E. I post on the uh, A Song of Ice and Fire subreddit, but I also have a blog at Cantus dot uh, WordPress dot com where you can find all of the stuff I've written. Um, most people know me for the stuff I've written about Stannis, which is uh, either uh, the Night Lamp. And then all of the ensuing theory after that, that I called like the manifesto about what Stannis might be up to. But I also write a lot of other crazy stuff, like the theory about Rhaegar's harp being in Lyanna's tomb and uh, other stuff along those lines. Yeah, you guys check him out. He has like the night lamp theory is probably one of my top five, (laughs) one of my top five favorite theories at the moment. So check him out. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. So we're going to get right into the juice. Um, Brand 3 is basically one big, fat, crazy coma dream. It's a short chapter. Really, it's maybe four pages. Everything before Brand 3 was pretty much like politics as usual, like normal, run-of-the-mill, medieval book not very much magic, not very much fantasy, excluding like the prologue um, with the White Walkers and Sir Waymar Royce and all of that. But Brand 3 really ramps up the fantasy. And then after Brand 3, the fantasy kind of fades into the background. And that's one of the characteristics of Game of Thrones and A Song of Ice and Fire that I think has made it so popular. Well, let me let me word that better. That not being overly saturated too early with magic is one of the things that made Game of Thrones and A Song of Ice and Fire appeal to a much broader audience because we get this coma dream, but then the magical fantasy side of the story kind of disappears in the background and builds and builds until we get the birth of dragons. So you actually like experience the magic come to life on the pages and that isn't easily done. Nor is it something that I have experienced with any other book series. Like, I, I like fantasy, um, Lord of the Rings, The Hobbit, Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn. I, but nothing has been Game of Thrones or A Song of Ice and Fire. And I feel like what better way to hint at a more magical world than to, like, experience it through Bran in a dream where you don't know what's yeah. real and what's not. That was one of the things that I think uh, people who read the book before me sold me on was they were like, oh, it's fantasy, but it's not the fantasy you expect. It doesn't have all of these different creatures like elves and dwarves and stuff. And uh, it doesn't really have magic. It focuses more on this other stuff. So you read it for the first time and then you get introduced to, oh, wow, there is this really magical element. But because you already have kind of seen that it's really delivering this other story you roll with it and i don't know it really does work by the end you're really kind of swept up in stuff stuff that maybe would have turned you off from the genre had it been like on page one although it is cool that it also opens with the others too so you you know what i mean it's like just enough magic to really kind of excite you but not to make you feel like oh this is this is fantasy this is like a genre fiction that i don't really want to explore yeah yeah, like the well, like when you get the prologue, it's kind of like it's mysterious magic. Like, is this magic? Like, what is this? Is this some kind of weird fantasy? Could it be sci-fi? Like, what is it? Like, what's going on? But then when you get Bran's coma dream, it really is like again not clear what you're actually getting. Like, you don't know if you're getting magic. You don't know if it's a dream. You don't know 
like if it's real what's going on because you know that Bran is in a coma and he fell from a tower and he's been in a coma for a long time so Mm -hmm. it's really interesting how he did it and I've never been like swept up in a book like A Song of Ice and Fire ever no yeah I I don't read a lot of uh, fiction in general I'm kind of a nerd always reading nonfiction, and I gave these a try off the recommendation of a friend and I was just blown away. I think I'm not also a big fan of like w- richly built worlds, but I like the way the world building the story happens where you kind of, the first time you read it, it's so overwhelming. You can't keep track of all these details, but it doesn't feel like you have an appendix to go back to. You just have to realize that it's a human story and maybe on a reread, it'll make more sense. I just really admire the way these are structured and they feel like really human stories, which unlike a lot, like I love, I love Lord of the Rings, but I just feel like it's um, not as the stories aren't driven by like emotions as much as this is. And I think that it just spoke to me a whole lot more than other uh, stuff in the genre. Yeah. I mean, I a hundred percent agree. It's like the Lord of the Rings is a high fantasy, magical story. Um, And kind of, it's kind of like cliche really. Mm -hmm. And this doesn't feel like that at all this feels like with like the mythology that he's worked in and the world building and all of the seeds that he's planted and like on in one chapter it's a murder mystery like in the next chapter Mm -hmm. it's like something complete like it's politics and backstabbing so he did amazing and i feel like that you know like wins a winner is taking a long time because look what kind of book this is what other book besides Maybe Dune, D- yeah, Dune. Um, maybe is kind of on the level of this of a Song of Ice and Fire series because Quinn from Ideas of Ice and Fire or from Quinn's Ideas, um, got me into reading Dune, and I feel like it's on the same level as a Song of Ice and Fire. Well, maybe I should give Dune another shot. <laughs> Didn't I- like it. <laughs> Uh, I know it was revolutionary at the time, but I've kind of gotten into some online tussles because I don't really care for Dune or for Ender's Game. I so, never read Ender's Game. Nah, uh, people will hate me, but you're not missing much. Well, I like the. I will say I like the world building of Dune and like the themes. That, oh yeah, that are yeah, going it, on. It was ahead of its time as far as that goes. Yeah, definitely. So, um, about Brand's coma dream. Let's just get into it so the dream is a hundred percent prophetic right the, would you say it's prophetic mm, yeah um yeah well he the part where he can finally like see lucidly and he it's like he can see the whole world um i, I it's it's almost like a remote viewing like he can see everything that's going on it's prophetic in terms of like he, it's his first introduction to the three-eyed crow being this very real being that's this force out there trying to keep him alive for whatever reason. So I think it's ominous. Um, but at this time you don't really have an idea like what it's, what it's telling him. Right. There's so many. So in my notes, I put um, so many questions in bold because there's a lot of layers I feel like going on in this dream. Um, but I want to talk about one thing <laughs> and um it's going to probably sound lame. I want to talk about gray mist. I know out of like, I wanted to talk about that too. This is awesome. (laughs) Okay. I I was going to say, I know out of all like the exciting shit that's going on. I want to talk about gray mist. Uh, Yeah, I know. No, it's a a big deal. I think we're onto something. (laughs) So Bran mentions the gray mist in this chapter alone, like four or five times. Mm -hmm. And the only other times in this series that gray mist is mentioned is in dreams and or magical rituals. It seemed as though he had been falling for years. Fly, a voice whispered in the darkness, but Bran did not know how to fly, so all he could do was fall. Maester Lewin made a little boy of clay, baked him till he was hard and brittle, dressed him in Bran's clothes, and flung him off a roof. Bran remembered the way he shattered. But I never fall, he said falling the ground was so far below him he could barely make it out through the gray mist that whirled around him but he could feel how fast he was falling and he knew what was waiting for him down there even in dreams you could not fall forever he would wake up in the instant before he hit the ground he knew 
you always woke up in the instant before you hit the ground. So Brand describes a gray mist like chasing him around or like not chasing, like there's not a mist chasing him, but he's surrounded by this gray mist and whispering voices. And to- I totally believe that the mist is like, I was actually going to pose the question to you about like, who do you think is like, if this was a play, who are the characters? And I, I mean, obviously you've got the crow and you've got Bran, but I almost wanted to characterize the mist as this third other character. Um, Cause Martin has a tendency to like kind of get, give anthropomorphic characters, characteristics to mist in his stories, not just in this story, but um, in his other work. Mm-hmm. So uh, his, his very first story was this uh, short story was uh, with morning comes Mistfall, And it was the, literally about the idea of this planet where there's mist in it. It covers the entire planet at, uh, at night and only goes away during the day. And it's just, it's just a common motif that he uses throughout his stories. And when you look for it elsewhere in the books, the mist is almost frequently given like this ghostly kind of like animus. Yeah. I was wondering, like, is, does the mist, if it represents a person, like, could the person be Blood Raven? Could it, could it be, uh, but the, the crow represents Blood Raven, but could it be some kind of magical plane? Like, could the mist represent, like, a magical plane that is being accessed, like a green seer plane or something to that um. effect? I don't, um, I don't really know. I mean, it's always possible. Um, so I did write another essay a couple of years ago, which had this really crazy theory about um, who like Mance Raider might be. And I don't want to talk about that, but at the beginning I made a point to kind of uh, analyze the appearance of mist and its association with ghosts. Um, and so um, there, there's these stories where like a uh, Catelyn is talking to uh, uh, Hoster Tilly and she talks about how like the strange fog came up and they, they were trapped in this like gray mist and they couldn't see anything and the trees were reaching out to grab them. And then Peter rode back and saved them. And then there's also another chapter with Catelyn where she's kind of looking at uh, Renly's army as it kind of collapses after the assassination. And uh, in addition to watching the army kind of uh, royal, from a distance, she notices like mist creeping across the field as the sun rises, and she refers to it as uh, morning ghosts. She says specifically morning ghosts. She had heard old man call them once, spirits returning to their graves. So it's hmm. just a, yeah. That's interesting. You're saying the mist in the story, the characters relate the mist to ghosts. Yeah, yeah. Um, in particular, there's a lot of times where characters kind of refer to mist, or mist tends to have this uh, this association with ghosts. Um, uh, as a matter of fact, um, when Merillon or Merillion, whatever his name is, mm-hmm. um, is like awaiting execution in the Eyrie, he sings a bunch of these like mourning, uh, sad songs. Um, and part of that essay I wrote was talking about how there's this idea of ghostly women and in particular mothers. And it's just weird because Marillin's singing and one of the songs he sings is uh, On a Misty Morning or On a Misty Morn is I think the name of the song. And uh, it's about a mom who wakes up in uh, in the morning after a battle and she's trying to find the body of her son after this battle. But if you pay attention to his song selection, it really feels like he's singing basically like what uh, Lysa Tully might've wanted her son to hear or something like that because it's like the the castle becomes strangely almost like haunted with like eerie winds and he's doing all these creepy songs that seem to just remind everybody of Lysa Tully. Oh yeah, that's a that's a good point. You're blowing my mind in real time. <laughs> You're blowing my mind on my own podcast. <laughs> so, but well, yeah, that makes that makes a lot of sense that it would be something like this. So I watched, um, so the movie, like the sixth sense, right. There's this thing where, um, in the movies and in books where they do, well, I'll say in the movie. So in sixth sense, like every time a ghost appears, you'll see the color red, whether it be like a red blanket or he has a red shirt on. I don't know what that technique is called, but, it could be this a similar thing to that in yeah. this in this story. Yeah, um, I, I I kind of agree. Like, I in a way I think Martin likes to flirt 
flirt with like the boundary between what you think um, could be happening and like let your imagination race. Um, so like, I think he's happy to say, oh, I don't really know if that's a ghost or not. What do you think? Um, because like there's, I'll use another example. Martin also another like uh, very similar trick he likes to play is he likes to play with deep places in the earth, whether it's, uh, um, you know, the caverns underneath uh, the north of the wall or like the steps going down in the house of white and black, or if it's uh, the cavern underneath uh, uh, Blood Raven's caves uh, mm -hmm. with that un un like dark sea or whatever. Uh, he likes to create these dark spaces and just not tell you because I feel like it's like this trick he likes to use where it's like, let's let your imagination fill it in because I guarantee you, it, you'll do a better job of making it creepy than he could. Yeah, he likes to fuck with us, <laughs> basically. <Yeah. laughs> well, I, I found this quote from A Mystery Night and um, it's about Blood Raven. Mm -hmm. And it says, oh. how many... Go ahead. I, I I know the quote. It's good. Is it going to be about Blood Raven uh, when he's disguised as Plum and like there's a gray fog around him or a gray mist? No, I didn't even get that one. <laughs> it's all right. But that's more evidence that this mist could have something to do with Blood Raven. Mm -hmm. how, good point. So the quote says, "How many eyes does Lord Blood Raven have?" The riddle ran. A thousand eyes in one. Some claim the king's hand was a student of the dark arts who could change his face, put on the likeness of a one-eyed dog, even turn into a mist. Hmm. That's, so, a good, that's a good find. <laughs> so it raises a lot of questions. But then when you get the other quotes, like from where the gray mist has came up like it came up with Cersei so the quote is in life the crone had screamed at them in some queer foreign tongue and cursed them as they fled her tent but in the dream her face dissolved melting away into ribbons of gray mist until all that remained were two squinting yellow eyes the eyes of death and then with Melisandra Melisandra says um and she's talking about the glamour that she's put on Mance and um she says he was cloaked in shadows too and wisps of ragged gray mist. Oh, good. Yeah. I actually know the quote you're talking about, but I didn't think of that one when I was doing my research. So there's definitely something going on with this gray mist and not to like bring the show in. Cause I know like the show. Yeah. But not to bring the show in, but when Bran um, went to blood Raven's cave in the show, like it was all like all that mist was everywhere. And I was like, Oh God, gray mist. Cause I've been obsessed with it for years. Thinking yeah. that like something is up with the mist. Is it a person? Is it blood Raven? If it's not Blood Raven, who is it? Because Melisandre also says, like, the great other is the person who comes to your dreams and fucks with you. True. But in Melisandre's point of view chapter, it's almost like Blood Raven and Bran come into her dreams, even though she says she doesn't even sleep. I got the feeling that, like, when she sees uh, the man of the half tree person and then, uh, uh, a boy wolf and then they look at her that they were like somehow messing with her maybe not intentionally but it sounded like that was implying that they were aware that she was seeing them and i wonder if she has them confused with evil people or if they're actually evil because i really question blood raven's motivations oh yeah the three-eyed crow's motivations i really question that because Oh, the chapter, the brand two chapter that I did with Joe Magician, mm -hmm. we were talking about um, the idea that Summer is trying to warn Bran. Like, it, the chapter feels like Summer is trying to warn Bran from whatever he's doing. Like, he's howling at him to get down. Like, he knows what's going to happen, and he doesn't want it to happen. And then the crow is kind of like, the person that does want these things to happen. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like, if, point. like, like he needed brand to fall. If we, if we believe that falling opened his third eye, then he needed brand to fall in order to awaken his gifts. I, I 
that's a really good observation and it could be true. I actually haven't spent a lot of time questioning um, Blood Raven's motivations. I don't really know if they're good or not, but they might be like the kind of good where it's very utilitarian in nature. Like I need to save the world and I don't care if I have to name this little kid to do so kind of thing. Yeah. It, it feels like that to me. Like it feels like, I don't feel like he's necessarily evil, but I don't think he's good either. He's just like a nest, like a necessity. Yeah. That makes, that makes a lot of sense. So Bran is falling and falling and falling. <laughs> mm-hmm. yep. And the he's talking to the crow and the crow is like, you know, you need to fly. You're going to die. You need to fly. And basically he tells him to fly or die. And Bran um, eventually flies. Can, oh, can, can we, can we back up for just a sec? Cause there's a spot in this that I kind of thought was noteworthy. Sure. Um, during the falling, um, the crow's like, hey, you know, you're falling, you're going to hit the ground. And he's like, hey, do you have any corn? And Bran reaches into his pocket and he just pulls out some corn and the, cor- the, the, the crow's like, awesome, and like starts to eat. And the reason I find that interesting is because it's this sort of like dream state, right? And mm-hmm. Bran's having trouble getting like, getting the idea that he can fly. But when the crow's like, hey, do you got corn? He just happens to have corn in his pocket. It's just, it's one of those interesting things like where was the corn always in his pocket? If it's a dream, did was that an example of like the crow saying, Hey, do you have any corn? And like brands like, well, I should have corn in my pocket. So it was easy. And it just, he has the corn. Do you get what I'm saying? Like, it's like, I start to wonder if it was like the crow was like, let's see if he can do this at least. Let's see if he can have corn in his pocket. Yeah. Like if he can think, if he can, if he can think that he has corn, like if he can think to do this one action, then maybe he can fly. W- weren't yeah. they circling for corn? Like when he fell, they were circling above him. Like, yeah, the last page, the last um, words on the page of brand two is off in the distance, a wolf was howling. Crows circled the broken tower waiting for corn. Yep. So that's kind of like, more to the point of like you know the wolf summer that will that will eventually be named summer the wolf and the crow are not on the same page like the wolf is howling and mourning and the crow is sit and the crow is sitting there licking his chops like come here little boy <laughs> about to get yeah. you that's a really good point but yeah uh they had established earlier in that chapter that Bran's favorite thing to do is to go up there and get corn to the crows. And so it's this weird thing where like, did, did the three eyed Raven um, know uh, that Bran likes to give corn? Um, yeah. I'm assuming he obviously must've, but it's just, it's just interesting that um, he was observing him and then knew like, Hey, did you got any corn? And Bran just happens to in his dream have corn. It's yeah. just, I, I just find it interesting and it's just one of those things that's easy to wonder because I feel like Martin's a kind of an intentional writer. Uh, he doesn't, things have meaning, even if it feels like it's really quick. Like, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, I think the things that we miss in passing because they seem so quick and trivial, sometimes it's like you stop, maybe you, you pick up on something. I don't really have anywhere to go with it, but it's just something I like to think about. Like maybe this corn was some uh, casual test because you know, the crow's not, the crow's like, hey, you're going to die. And he's not really doing anything. He says, hey, do you, have any, do you have any corn? And when he pulls the corn out, that's when the crow lands on him and starts to eat the corn. Um, in other words, I always feel like the crow is kind of like casually trying to like see what he can do with this, per- with this person. And he only really starts to get aggressive with Bran when Bran has that vision of Jamie. Yes. Oh, my God. We're going to talk about that. <laughs> I can't yeah. wait to talk about that one. Do you want to just go into Jamie's face right now? Yeah, sure. Uh, we can. So basically, um, he, he uh, what is it? Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. It says a face swam up out of him out of the gray mist. There it is again, shining with light golden. The things I do for love, it said. And that's when Bran screams and the crow's like, hey, well, you don't need that right now. Stop thinking about that. Yeah. And uh, that, that's when the crow, because the crow was just sitting there eating and saying, hey, dude, you're going you're gonna to die when you hit the ground. And he just keeps eating and he's like taking his time. And it's when that vision pops up. That's when the crow like lands and starts like trying to hit him with his wings or whatever. And uh, it just feels like that vision like prompts a change in what the crow's like strategy, like rhetorical strategy is. Before it's like, hey, we're just going to be casual. We're going to get this kid to change his mind, see that he can do it, hopefully. 
Um, and then when Brand has that vision, that Crow's like, no, we got to we got to do something different. This is not working. And yeah. I just, oh, go ahead. No, and I just I, I find that fascinating. I don't really know how to process it or like what big insight I can get out of it. It's just clearly the crow was not happy with the vision of Jamie popping up in his head. Yeah, and I, I don't know if it's because he doesn't want Bran to get like sidetracked into like he has some specific plan for Bran. And Bran remembering what happened to him could get him sidetracked. Mm -hmm. But I also find it fascinating that in this dream, he remembers what happened to him. And when the crow tells him, you know, no, forget that. He literally forgets it in real life. Like when he yeah. wakes up, he does not remember what happened to him. Oh, that's a really good point. Yeah. He really doesn't recall it after that. Yeah. It's like he fucked with his memories. He erased his memory of what happened to him so that what, so I guess if Bran remembers what happened to him, when Tyrion arrives at Winterfell, things go a lot different because yeah. Bran would know, well, Jamie Lannister pushed me from a window. So whatever path Blood Raven has for Bran, it's planned out. So Bran remembering this, this event would likely alter that path. So I, I, but I found it so interesting on the reread that, you know, he says, put that away and Bran literally forgets it and doesn't know what happened to him. Yeah. You know, I got to say, I back that up because that makes a lot of sense to me because he really doesn't. And I mean, I was easy. I was happy to let it roll off as the idea of like maybe big impact doesn't really remember but clearly he does at least remember the face and what it looked like and what it, and what they said. And then, yeah, after he wakes up, never again. Yeah. And he remembers the dream when he wakes up, like, because that he named summer. He, so I'm yeah. like, it's, it, it's so fluid. Like it's one fluid thing. Like this chapter is the dream and he thinks he's still in the dream and he's awake. And then he named Summer. So, like, it's not like he forgot. You know, like, you can go to sleep and you forget a dream. Yeah, well, it's, <laughs> Tells it him. says it landed on Bran's shoulder and pecked at him. And the shining golden face was gone. Yeah, so he took that memory from Bran, I believe. Definitely. Well, I, yeah. Uh, I think maybe I need some time to digest it. But that's a pretty exciting idea. And that, make, like, that makes me wonder, like, what other memories he could play with he could um manipulate in other people actually that's that's another good point uh you made me think of uh, ned's um ned's milk of the poppy dream about the tower of joy fight because that's literally how all the other characters appear to him as uh figures of, made of gray mist exactly <laughs> so why is he showing him that yeah. Or is he showing him that? Or is Ned doing that on his... Like, I feel like with those dreams, there's there's always more to it. There's something being shown mm -hmm. by, by someone. And I think Melisandre, you know, hints at that a little bit. Because she's afraid to sleep. <laughs> or yeah, she, doesn't, yeah. she doesn't need to, but... She's, afraid She's definitely sleep. afraid to sleep because it feels like, based off of her point of view chapter, you get glimpses of her past pre Ashai or whatever. Which could also be Blood Raven. Like everything could be Blood Raven. Blood Raven, Blood Raven, Blood Raven. See, I, I, I tend to try and avoid <laughs> crazy conspiracies like that. Um, cause I don't know. If everything points to Blood Raven, it's just a little crazy. I mean, it could be true, but. So, but yeah, um, he, I know that he falls um, and, you know, and that's when it says uh, he's falling faster than ever. And again, with the gray mist, it says they, they howled around him as he plunged towards the earth. And again, this is where I was talking about the anthropomorphic quality because um, he's talking about the, the winds howling. And I mean, that's not uncommon for a writer to talk about wind in this way. But um, if I can jump ahead for a brief second, right when the crow finally convinces him to fly, he says, now, Bran, the crow, crow urged, choose, fly or die. And it says, death reached for him, screaming. 
and Bram spreads his wings and flew. And it's just one of those things where it's like, I mean, it's a great, it's a great line, but what does it mean that death for him screaming? Because uh, the ground was rushing up to him and they talk about the long towers of the trees with like spikes with people impaled on it. And I could see maybe those trees reaching for him, but could it be the mist was looking, was, you know, the one, the, the thing that's screaming in this case, because yeah. it was howling just a moment ago. Yeah. It could, I would think it was the mist. Like that's where my mind would go. Yeah. So, you know, I don't really know what to make of it, like from a logic perspective, but it does seem like the mist represents some other force um, that's, in my opinion, trying to basically pull, keep Bran distracted until like the spikes get him. And the three-eyed raven is basically, or three-eyed crow is basically like, no, don't listen to that. Let's fly. Oh, well, the mist could be like the great other or something. Yeah, maybe I, maybe that's what it is. Or maybe it's, uh, you know, I also want to say that this is kind of a separate topic is that I feel like Martin engages in this interesting reduction um, of like his use of symbols. Like he's got this very, this palette of symbols that he, I think keeps small. Everything is mist and stars and shadow. And so it's easy to see meaning and linkage between all of these. But I think that's intentional on his part by kind of using these these uh this vocabulary that kind of goes oh he talked about that as a red star he talked about this as a star are are they connected because you know everything from ghost's eye to the red messenger in the sky has been described as having a red star and in the same way mist is almost like this thing that he uses everywhere and it can be really hard to tell like when they actually have shared meaning and when it may might be just martin knowing that by kind of using this like this small library of symbolism it, it hooks, it engages your creative juices more because you're always wondering how it all might be connected. I wonder if the mist represents death. That's what I, that's actually what I basically kind of wondered if the mist in this case represents some sort of after death sort of thing. Like, cause that would tie makes, into like your ghost idea. Yeah. It, it ties into like maybe the reason Ned saw them as gray uh, as figures made out of gray mist is because they were dead um, or like ghosts, you know, in a way, you know, the, the way that dream was presented almost felt like he was reliving it. Um, right. And then Cersei. Like, oh, so, okay. So like what you're saying, Ned seeing ghosts um, as mist and then Cersei sees Maggie, the frog's face dissolve into ribbons of mist and she sees two yellow eyes and she calls them the eyes of death. And then we have Melisandre, which sees um, wisps of, he was cloaked in shadows and wisps of ragged gray mist. So he's basically portraying a dead man. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. So the mist could have more to do with that than it does with the illusion. Yeah. I think it, I, I bet it represents death. Yeah, um, and that's actually kind of where I was, what my inclination was as I was reading this, is I was like, well, it says death reached for him screaming. And the, you know, when I talked earlier about uh, the mist being this third character in the scene, like who else is, who else is there to scream other than the mist? So, I mean, I know that it could just be artful phrasing, but I was kind of like really leaning towards the idea that the mist is this, this thing that wants to, this force that wants to pull Bran into death. And the crow's kind of like, no, that's not really what I want for you. And basically acts to kind of intervene. Um, and along those lines, when, um, when Jamie's head pops up, the way it's described is he says, a face swam up at him out of the gray mist. But later when um, Bran hears his dad's voice, he, he says, I don't want to read the whole quote, but he says, he heard his own, uh, he says, can a man still be brave if he's afraid? He heard his own voice say, saying small and far away. And his own, his father's voice replied to him, that is the only time a man can be brave. And it's interesting because it's not at all uh, connected to the mist. Um, and as a matter of fact, there's no visual. And it's just described very differently because um, the mist actually says, um, you know, the things I, I do for love, and he actually sees all of this in front of him. But when he hears his dad and his conversation with his dad, it sounds far, far away. And it doesn't sound like it's the mist is involved in that experience. Mm-hmm. Almost like, like it's a real true memory 
or it's a moment in his life that he's reliving for whatever moment, but it, it basically sounds like it's disconnected from the mist. And if you're going to say the mist has some agenda, it would seem like the mist wants him to be distracted by this thing in front of him while so he's not looking at the ground, whereas the memory he had very clearly helped him figure out, get the confidence to fly. Yeah, I agree. That's an excellent point. Think about Bran, right, in the mist. I don't want to, like, <laughs> we're going to title this video The Gray Mist. <laughs> it's fine with me. So um, when you think about Bran, the what was that? Bran 1, where his father told him um, a man can only be brave. When a man is afraid is the only time he can be brave. So that is, uh, so there's, like, I would say three different things going on there's brand himself which is drawing um his own memories which would be the ned memory and then there is the crow which is doing all of the fly 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 like trying to keep him alive and then there's this third entity the mist which could represent death which could also be some kind of magical element to it that could be manipulated by some person that we don't know. Um, maybe White Walkers. I know there's no Night King in the book, but I feel like the Great Other could possibly be like the first other, maybe. Could be. Could be. Uh, it's there's so much it's, yeah, mystery. It's, there's there's no, nothing clear when it comes to the White Walkers, that's for sure. No. So let's talk about what Bran sees. Because he sees yes. a lot of things that are prophetic in nature. Um, well, I, I, I guess he sees real-time things that are going on. Like he uh, parachutes he, himself it, over the entire Westeros and sees everything. And yeah, essence. it's... It's basically like he's seeing everything in, in all of Westeros. Yeah, you're right. Um, he sees his mom on the boat with the knife in front of her. He sees Rob. He sees John at the wall. He sees, you know, his sisters. He sees Ned. Um, so uh, he, it's like he sees everything. And you're right. It I forgot it does say that he sees all the way uh, across to Essos and all the way to Shy by the Shadow. But um it really brushes over that. It's just, it's fascinating because the only other time a character seems to have at that level of like seeing the whole world all at once is a Vermeer six skins from the prologue to a dance of dragons. And it's when he is basically dying and he does that big jump to get into a uh, one eye, his wolf. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's the only other time that um, this kind of, that's, that's what I'm saying. Like this is one of the, this, is besides the birth of dragons, this is the most magical chapter in a Game of Thrones. Yeah. And may maybe like most of the series, this is one of the most magical chapters. So there's a lot of things going on. Um, it kind of foreshadows that Bran is going to be really powerful because he's able to do all this. Like imagine you're in Winterfell and you can see dragons stirring in the shadows of shy and it's funny because he says that they look across uh the dothraki sea and beyond to vast dothrak um and it sh what is uh hold on let, let me just read the quote um he lifted his eyes and saw clear across the narrow sea to the free cities and the green Dothraki Sea and beyond to Ves Dothrak under its mountain, to the fabled lands of the Jade Sea, to a shy by the shadow where dragons stirred beneath the sunrise. So I feel like that's prophetic in nature because we know that while there are no dragons yet, Daenerys has the dragon eggs and they will eventually hatch. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. I can agree with that. That does, yeah. You, if you have the right mindset, yeah, that definitely is prophetic. I didn't even really think about that. And also the um, part um, this is uh, this is debated about a lot. Uh, let me find the quotes. Is it about the statue, the armor, the armored giant dude? Yeah, yeah. That's what. Yeah, the Sansa. Yeah. 
Okay, so he saw Sansa crying herself to sleep at night, and he saw Arya watching in silence and holding her secrets hard in her heart. There were shadows all around them. One shadow was dark as ash with the terrible face of a hound. Another, armored like the sun, golden and beautiful, over them both loomed a giant in armor made of stone. But when he opened his visor, there was nothing inside but darkness and thick black blood. So... Do you think it's the? Do you think the first two are the Hound and Jamie Lannister? Um, I used to be kind of ambivalent. I almost thought that the the, the golden one was Cersei. But um, in researching for this uh, podcast, um, what I noticed is that the chapter before um, the only two people who aren't present at like Sansa uh, and Arya's trial when she gets caught is a. Uh, Jamie Lannister and the Hound because uh, and Ned actually comments on it he says he's like he was thankful that that Jamie and the Hound went there because they were leading search parties north of the camp mm -hmm. um, so uh, I don't know why but that made me kind of think hmm, maybe they're the shadows in this case I was already pretty content with the Hound being the one that sounds like the Hound but that made me feel, think like maybe when they say the shadows they're all around them it has to do with like actual like physical space and that they're not with them. They're around them as in like they're out leading these search parties. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I'm inclined to think it's Jamie and the hound for those two, for sure. What about the giant? Well, so, the mountain? <laughs> you know, it, I got to admit, it feels like it doesn't make a lot of sense, but the mountain's the best fit. I know about the major other competing theory, which is that it's for whatever reason, it's Peter and it's like the Titan of Bravos for yeah. some reason and it has to do with his like heart or his ventral nature um but uh so the armor made of stone so to me what uh, i have an essay i haven't written about the mountain and uh, one of the things i do is i point out the literature that uh, the similarities between um the mountain and frankenstein and the golem um mm -hmm. the mythical creature and he's basically like a a golem made of flesh but in his armor he's like a tank plus you've got the theories about him possibly missing his head and we already know that the manticore venom that uh the viper gave him turned his blood to like black goo so he fits in a whole number of reasons the only reason it doesn't fit is because you can see why he would loom over his brother but it's less clear what he you know how he would loom over jamie or um, or be around sansa and Arya. Yeah. Yeah, um, and he's not there. He's not with you know. He's not there in that moment. But neither is Littlefinger. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's it's one of those things where I feel like um, you know we don't have enough information to know the answer right now. Um, I want to say that I feel like okay with like if I found out it was the Mountain or Peter, I'd be like, oh, there have been good theories about that for a while now. Um, and I'd be probably content with either one, but I don't know. Like, it just feels like maybe this is something that we don't have enough information to answer. The yeah. other big, the other big concern is that it's, this would be a real big stretch for Martin to have planted a seed in the first book and not, <laughs> not have somehow like confirmed it by now in some other book. Uh, yeah. he, he does plant seeds that bear fruit much later, but that's pretty far. Um, like my favorite example is that uh, he planted the seeds for uh, Mance Raider uh, using a glamour in Storm of Swords. So you know, about 11 years before the book came out and we found out that he survived the execution, um, he had already planted that idea in the book. So Yeah, the, he does that, like gives the answer way before the question yeah, is yeah. posed. <laughs> yeah, so where like if you, if, when you're on a reread, you go, oh, oh, whoa, this is totally insightful. Um, and I just feel like we're not there yet with, to know what this is. I mean, I lean towards the the mountain because, um, so one tiny thing I noticed is it says, over them both loomed a giant in armor. So for some, for whatever reason, I was wondering if this sort of implied that he loomed over the hound and Jamie in particular, but not the girls or the rest of the people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that could be, that could be possible. The reason I thought it was the mountain was because of the darkness and the thick black blood and like Robert Strong zombie mountain kind of yeah. thing. Yeah. Um, an armor made of stone. I don't know um, if that, if you would say like a 
if that represents being strong, I don't know. Um, but so, yeah, I, I, I think it, um, I think it might have to do with like a reference to his sort of impervious nature. And also the fact that he's more, like I said, I, I really had already uh, written um, about him being like basically a golem. And one of the things in that unpublished essay that I talk about is one of the issues with the mountain. If you remember the whole reason he attacks his brother is because his brother was playing with a toy knight that belonged to the mountain. And it was like this individually stringed up toy, like a mannequin, um, that, uh, sorry, not a mannequin, uh, what do you, a marionette, that he could do what he wanted with it. And, um, you know, I'm not, what's interesting about that is that is basically uh, like kind of like a symbol of what the mountain is. He's basically a tool for other people to use that in a large way doesn't seem to really have much of his own um, free will. Yeah. He's basically been Tywin's puppet forever and now he's Cersei's puppet. And uh, in a way, I feel like that toy knight really kind of encapsulates what he's like. And in a way, uh, the idea that he is now some sort of uh, golem like creature that has no free will, I, I don't know. It just seemed like it was a good comparison because it's this armor, this thing made of armor that's a giant that has basically nothing inside of it except for darkness and blood. And that's pretty. I like pretty the enough. idea. I like the idea that you said about like the mountain looming over Jamie and the hound and not necessarily Sansa and Arya, because if you think about it, like the hound is protective of Arya, like the hound becomes protective of Arya. And then Jamie um, sends Brienne to go find Sansa. So like the hound is looming over Arya and Jamie is looming over Sansa, but then the mountain is looming over both of them. Yeah. Yeah. It's, so it's I, the only I, way I, I like I could, that idea. Yeah. It was the only way I could make sense of it because like you said, if you assume that this figure is looming over everybody there, then neither one of them really work because you're like, well, Peter's not there. The mountain's not there. I, you know, Jamie doesn't really give a shit about Peter. I wonder if the savage giant that Sansa will slay is um, Sir Robert Strong and not Peter Baelish, because I think that's what people use as the clue that it's um, Baelish, actually, that is uh, in armor made of stone and, uh, and not the mountain, because the Ghost of High Heart says, you know, the same maiden that, has the serpents in her hair will slay a savage giant in a castle made of snow. So mm. maybe it's the mountain. If Sansa killed the mountain, I would be no more good. <laughs> yeah. If that, I would be blown away if something like that happened. If we see <laughs> the tin foil, that's not even tin. Yeah. Foil. That's Tupperware. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm more concerned, like, what happens to, if, like, Kyburn dies. Like, how do they control that thing? Like, <laughs> like well, Really? You know what I mean? Yeah, like, what, what do they, how do they control him? Does he just obey somebody, or is there, like, some control stick? Like, what happens if the batteries and the control stick fail? Like, there's a whole bunch of, like, questions that I have about how it all actually works and in, in, in practicality. Like, so I, the, the idea I have is it's, like, is it going to, could the mountain backfire? So. I mean, I think he could totally backfire. I, I like, I, I feel like Martin writes so realistic, like as realistic as you can for fantasy. And I'm pretty sure if he has like dragons eating other Targaryens and dragons killing other dragons, that the zombie mountain is not safe. If Kyburn, if something happens to Kyburn. Yeah. That, you know, I uh, actually, the show fans were what helped me appreciate this, but they're like, man, this is a joke. Daenerys is coming with her dragons and this army stuff. And what does Cersei got? She's got a zombie, a zombie dude. <laughs> that's it. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> yeah. Pretty, pretty pathetic. <laughs> yeah. But um, I want to talk about the last thing that Bran sees before he wakes up. So he sees John sleeping alone at the wall. 
And then he looked past the wall, past endless forests cloaked in snow, past the frozen shore and the great blue white rivers of ice and the dead plains where nothing grew or lived. North and north and north he looked to the curtain of light at the end of the world and then beyond that curtain. He looked deep into the heart of winter and then he cried out, afraid, and the heat of his tears burned on his cheeks. Now you know the crow whispered as it sat on his shoulder. Now you know why you must live. Why, Bran said, not understanding, falling, falling, because winter is coming. So Bran sees uh, the curtain of light at the at the end of the world and the heart of winter. And I've always wondered, like, what what is the heart of winter like what did he see did he see a white walker did he see uh some kind of grumpkin and snark something terrified him to the point like he screams out like everything he's seen before this <laughs> uh the the crow talking to him seeing jamie's face all of the things that he's seen like with his sisters and this bloody night made of stone black blood and all this none of this has freaked him out but whatever he saw in the north freaked him out terribly Mm. you know i think this might be um one of those cases where i you know i know he would never answer the question but i wonder (laughs) if martin I, i wonder if martin even knows because could this be like what i said when i talked about like the idea of like let's not fill that information in because your imagination does a better job of being more terrified of it than than he ever could um because you know oh, yeah, the know. dark I, places yeah like the dark places and stuff like is this another example of that where like by the absence of clarity is what creates mystery as a matter of fact that was actually the main theme of his book that was, that novella that with morning comes misfall is because he it's uh, this is a great example of how martin borrows from his own stuff is that that book uh sorry novella again it's this futuristic planet that's covered with this mist and the only really place thing to do there is to go to this hotel that's built up way high in the mountains and people go there and what they do is during the day they go down into the valleys and they have fun looking through ruins trying to find wraiths that live in the mist and then at night everybody goes back up to the hotel because the fog comes back in and that's when the, the wraiths come out and anyways the scientist shows up and he's like you know what this is bullshit i'm gonna go down there i'm gonna prove that there's absolutely nothing down there and the guy who runs the hotel is like you're, you, you're a jerk and you want to take away all the fun. And I mean, the hotel person is kind of like, you know, you don't really want to side with him because if there's nothing there, you know, people should know that. But on the other hand, all he's really trying to say is, is that the mystery is half the fun. And actually, as a matter of fact, the prologue of that novella has a quote from Martin where he basically says, if we were able to find out like a Bigfoot was real or a Loch Ness was real, would that actually make our lives better? Um, would it enrich you humanity to know the answers and to have no mystery left yeah um, so i i kind of wonder if this is kind of like his way of trying to keep some mystery even in his writing because if he told you you would have a name you would have something to call it and then it wouldn't be um it, you you wouldn't be afraid of it anymore because it would be easy for us to pigeonhole it and label it as to trying to really answer what it is something something truly inhuman and and scary and evil is all I can think of. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I almost wonder if that's the that's the genius behind this approach is because our it, you have to project some of your own fear into it. So it's whatever scares you is probably what Brant saw. Yeah, I mean that's another thing that I think makes a Song of Ice and Fire really successful is that it does have a lot of mystery. Like what what has Dance of Dragons been out for? What uh, how many years? Ten, nine no. years. Yeah, about 10 years now. And then the first A Game of Thrones book was written in 1996. And we still come up with new theories. We have so, like the, the Game of Thrones, A Song of Ice and Fire community has new theories all the time because there's so much mystery and there's so much that when you read it, your mind just takes off. And I love that he did that. And I hope there is a lot of stuff. There are questions that I want answered just because, but there are things that I'm like, okay, I hope he doesn't even answer that. Just let me wonder. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm glad, I'm glad he said that we might never see Valeria because 
I kind of like I want to see it so bad but then at the same time I don't want it to be ruined like with Rhaegar in the show <laughs> mm-hmm. so, like I had this idea of what Rhaegar was gonna be and I would have rather just kept the idea than getting yeah, the well, recycled Viserys but yeah in, ge- in general it's like nothing really would have lived up to like what you have in your mind yeah the hype uh, I, as a matter of fact, so like one of my other big theories was is the one about how um, uh, Jenny's song, the song that like uh, the ghost of High Heart really loves, was actually mm-hmm. written by Rhaegar, um, and that it actually it kind of encodes the, the actual prophecy. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, when asked, there's a there's a on the Westeros.org website, there's a couple of so spake Martin articles that talk about this song. And at an old convention, somebody asked him, like, hey, you know, um, what, you know, do you ever write more lyrics to that song? Because, you know, all we know is, like, the high in the halls of the kings who are gone mm-hmm. part. And he's like, yeah, you know, I wanted to write more, but, like, I'm kind of really bad at that. And I could never make it sound as good as I wanted it to. So that's why he only has, like, the one verse. So... But, to, you know, to be honest, that's actually a part that I used to try and justify my theory. It was like, oh, he ob- it obviously is super important because he doesn't even trust himself to write the lyrics to the song. But, you know, it's just an example. That's a good point. Yeah, it's just, it's just um, I feel like Martin really likes to uh, have us fill in the blanks on our own because we can do better uh, at what we're afraid of than, than he can. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and that's why it's a success. Eh, and that's why it's Jesus. <laughs> why can't I say successful? And that's why it's as successful as it is because mm-hmm. you, like you're saying, you can project your your own thoughts onto what it is, and you can talk about other people, talk to it, talk about it with other people, and they can project their own thoughts on it, and it's like a never ending circle. And I love it. Um. So Bran wakes up. So he flies. He finally flies. The three-eyed crow is pecking at his head, trying to uh, open his third eye. But he wakes up in Winterfell, and, like, the servant lady runs out, and she's like, he's awake, he's awake. And um, Bran touches his forehead between his eyes, and the place where the crow had pecked him was still burning. But, like, there wasn't any blood there or anything, but he still felt it, which means it was it whatever was happening in his coma state whatever it was real because it's affecting him in real life and we know it was real well i'm gonna say i theorize it was real because he doesn't remember jamie after the three-eyed crow tells him to forget jamie um but the one of the most interesting parts of it is that when he wakes up um basically the first thing he says is that um his name is Summer. It's about his direwolf. Mm-hmm. When Rob walks in, he's like, his name is Summer. That's the first thing he he's th- did was name his direwolf. And I think it's because whatever he saw in winter, in, in winter, in the heart of winter, beyond the curtain of light, terrified him so much that he named his direwolf Summer because he is going to go to battle with winter. Mm, that's a yeah i this is one of those things that i didn't really spend that much time thinking about but yeah i can't see any reason to object to that that makes that makes sense yeah makes total sense yeah so like that's basically brand three brand's coma dream did you have anything that you wanted to add that you didn't get to add that you didn't didn't get to say Uh, i covered everything i honestly was really blown away by the fact that the thing you really wanted to talk about was the mist because to me (laughs) So you sound like me, like in the sense that you probably use Kindle to probably do some research and ha- especially help with word searches. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I was like, I had, because I'd already written essays to talk about ghosts and mist. I was like, this is awesome. I, I didn't realize there's so much mist in this chapter. So I started searching. And I was like, oh, wow, there's a, there's a lot of stuff to talk about here. So yeah, just- <clears throat> one of my first, you got the juice. We had to bring you back for a Spanish chapter. For oh yeah. well, for a Davos chapter. Do you know people are like ready to go to war for a Davos chapter? <laughs> They're like, you should have a duel for a Davos chapter. But everybody so, wants to talk about Stannis. Everybody. 
So I would love to do Davos 2 in A Clash of Kings because uh, part of my big essay that I have yet to publish is talking about Stannis's compassion. And I feel like most people upon hearing that would be like, dude, what are you smoking? And uh, it's because I feel like a lot of people don't really give him credit because they don't understand. I'm not trying to say I've got access to special knowledge. I really don't. But I think that if you look at things from a certain perspective, you have to realize and kind of acknowledge that Stannis actually has a fair amount of compassion that goes unrecognized because he seems like such a petulant little shit a lot of the time. Yeah, I, to be honest, wasn't a Stannis fan. And I'm still not necessarily a Stannis fan, but um, I I don't know if you saw the Stannis episode that I did with um, Jeff. I feel like Jeff makes a good case for him. Uh, Brendan B. Fish. I think mm-hmm. he, he makes a good case for Stannis. The only really thing in the books, because let's be clear, he hasn't burned Shireen in the books. <laughs> the only real issue that I have with Stannis is the Courtney Penrose situation. That's, um, why, I wanted, that's why I want to do it. Is that You want Davos too? Okay. Yeah. Because you, you got to devils too. Because <laughs> to me, if I can pull off making people realize that he's compassionate in that scene, or at least to a degree that they maybe haven't acknowledged, then that opens up the door to further discussion about his compassion elsewhere in the books. It's, do you know I'm a huge Courtney Penrose fan? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is going to be fun. <laughs> That'll be fun. We'll, d- we'll definitely bring you back for devils too. Okay. I'm but done. I. I appreciate you coming on for Brand 3, this Coma Dream. I feel like we had a great discussion. Um, I hope everyone goes and checks you out on Reddit. Thanks for listening, and I will see you guys next week.